Alain Broussard only hummed, too tired to speak. Do you remember what we talked about this afternoon? She said. At lunch? Uh-huh, he replied, not really remembering. Well, she said, I think I have an idea. Let's hear it. Okay, here's the deal. Focus, Alain, she said. It's important and it's going to profit us. He shifted his gaze to her and nodded. So every day we accrue interest. Every single day. On all deposits, investments, mortgages, short-term and long-term commercial paper. On all of it, and we do it every, every day. He nodded. Yeah. So? Down to ten thousandths of a cent, right? He nodded. Well, let me ask you this. When you get your savings account statement, does it show fractions of a cent? Or just cents? Only cents. She nodded. That's exactly right. Your statement says $12.34, for example, right? He nodded. Not 12 whole, three-fourths, two-ninths, six-thirds, right? He nodded again, not realizing where this was going. Her smirk grew even wider. You'd never know if someone removed fractions from cents, would you? He opened his eyes, realizing the importance of her words. So we create a dummy account, and all those fractions of a cent from each account, every day, go into the dummy account. Then we automatically transfer the balance of the dummy account to a numbered account, perhaps in Switzerland or the Caymans. It's just fractions, but... He finished the thought for her, unable to contain his excitement. But in millions of accounts every day, it's... Christ, it's a goddamn fortune! She nodded, pleased with herself. It's actually about 900,000 a month, give or take, she said. Some months the percentage will be lower, some months higher. But on average, we're aiming for 900,000 a month. But is it doable? I mean, I'm sure it can be done somehow. But won't we get caught? Who's checking this shit? And frankly, I don't know shit about computers. She nodded. All right, then, he said. Well, we've got you to cover our ass from on high. You're the senior vice president of commercial paper, so you sign off on overseas transfers on a regular basis. Yeah, he said. And that's where the first problem arises. We're going to have to create not one, but a whole bunch of new accounts. The system will call the IRS on any daily transfer of more than 10,000 from one account. So we'll have to start four or five accounts just to be on the safe side. Okay, she agreed. And we have me. I do the auditing. Not a big shot, obviously, but I can keep an eye on things. So we've got two bases out of three. The money haul has been dealt with. The trace is hidden. Now we need someone to hack into the computer defenses and program the system to do what we need it to do. She raised her eyebrows at him. Any ideas? For the first time, he felt a smile appear on his face. I think there are he said. And we're going straight to the top. Richards? She asked. Broussard nodded. He's perfect. He's the best. That's why he runs electronic security. He's a freaking genius if you listen to what Jensen says about him. But can he do it? I was thinking of someone more, I don't know, vulnerable. Broussard rubbed his hands together. Oh yeah, given the right amount of temptation, he'll do it. Just got divorced. I heard him talking in the executive dining room, and he's getting slammed with alimony. He needs the money. She frowned. Yeah, but will he get caught with it? I mean, if we get caught, we go to jail. And we'll go broke, professionally and financially. Are you chickening out already? Hell no, she said. I know the risks, but I'm willing to take them. And you know them, but that won't stop you. The chances of us getting caught are slim, especially with all the bases covered, but they're still there. And he's a small fry. He'll be scared off by the low side, no matter how small the chances of getting caught. That's where you come in handy, said Broussard. You see, he's also lonely, and I've seen the way he looks at you. If we do this right, he'll have you wrapped around his finger in a matter of weeks. She frowned, pondering what that would mean. Broussard laughed, tensing at the thought. Think about it, he said. You'll have a doozy. She laughed back. I already have one, she said. His name is my husband. Alan was right. Jeff Richards was a lost puppy. His divorce was a heavy financial burden that required him to give half his net income to child support and alimony. He'd been moved from a five-bedroom house on the North Shore to a two-bedroom apartment far from the city. He hadn't spoken to a woman in over a year. She was elusive at first. After two weeks, she sat with him in the executive dining room and chatted about work, music, movies, and art. Soon she was sitting with him every day and the conversations became more personal. When he told her how much he was going through a divorce, she even brushed away a tear by stroking his arm. The seduction was completed a month after it began. They were leaving the office together, and she invited him for a ride along the lakeshore. 
30 minutes later, they parked in the far corner of the Forest Preserve parking lot, away from other cars and prying eyes. I want to ease your pain. He shrieked, almost a squeak. But, but, you're married, he stammered. She lowered her head, closing her eyes. Her voice became lower. I know, she said, but that's not the point. I want to help you and no one can know about it. I, well, the last few weeks, the pain you've been feeling, I've been feeling it myself. Three weeks later, they were lying together on the bed in his cramped apartment. She had spent the previous weeks giving him rides and planting the seeds of their plan in his mind. She knew he was dependent on her now and had gotten to the point where he was willing to destroy for her if she asked. Now was the time to strike, promising him that with the money they could run away together and they would never be found. She told him the plan and what he needed to do. Richards was reluctant at first, but she snapped at him. You're right, she said. We don't need much to be together. She saw his eyes light up at the thought. But unless you want to pay alimony for the rest of your life to that cheating whore who ruined you, we're going to have to move far away, get new identities, and have enough money to live on until we get settled in our new lives. What about your husband? He replied. I can't stay with him anymore, she replied, trying to brush a tear from her eye and succeeding. He's a bastard, cheating on me with everything that moves. At least now I have you. I just want to be happy and for that I need you. She looked into his eyes. Please, Jeff, tell me you'll do that. When we have enough, we can leave together. Forever. She'd seen his car as she pulled into the garage, but she didn't want to see him now. No need to get confrontational. Hi, Deborah, he said from behind, startling her. She froze. Alain, she replied, and turned to see him leaning against the bar. Where have you been? Unable to avoid talking to him, she put her purse on the counter and walked over to the refrigerator, pulled out the bottled water and unscrewed the cap. I asked where you've been, he insisted. She took a sip from the bottle, then shifted her gaze to him and replied, Why do you care? You're my wife, she snorted. What, no girlfriends available tonight? The expression on his face went from cold to hot in an instant. I already told you there are no girlfriends. Christ, there haven't been any for seven years ever since you caught me and... And your whore of the month? He said nothing, just clenched his jaws and tried to look down at her. Really, Alain, please don't play me for a fool. If you think I'm still having an affair... Affairs, honey, she said, smiling. Plural. Fine, he snapped back. Affairs. If you think I'm still having affairs, why are you still here? Why don't you just leave me and move on with your life? She took a sip of water and held his gaze. They'd had this conversation before, too many times to count. I'm Catholic, she said. Very Catholic. You know that. And what's worse, Daddy's an even bigger Catholic. So I have to be a good little wife, overlook your misdeeds, and be there for you. He'll never leave you, said Broussard. You know he will? You're his little princess. He put the emphasis on princess, and Deborah felt her blood rise. Still, there's no point in taking chances, is there? Not when a prenup cuts you off at the knees. So you'll live your life and I'll live mine, and we'll never meet. She took another sip from the water bottle before continuing. But rest assured, she said, once he's gone, so will you. So you're having fun with someone else? He asked. A sinister smile curved his lips. Combined with his mane of dark hair streaked with gray, he looked wild. For a moment, she remembered the strong attraction that had drawn her to him 20 years ago. Then she thought of what a real bastard he'd turned out to be, and the pleasant memories evaporated. I asked if you were having fun with someone else, he repeated. She only smiled back. You're a damn whore, he said, and walked away. She burst into laughter following his receding back. An hour later, Broussard sat in his locked den, staring at the images on the screen in front of him. Why am I going so crazy? He thought as he watched what was happening on the screen. His thoughts were drowned out by the dialogue with the image, but he knew it by heart. She's cheating on me, but so what? I've been cheating on her for years. Benjamin Bradford felt uncomfortable. Sure, he had been to nights like this before, but he had never fit in. Even with Jennifer by his side, introducing him to the big shots at Jensen National Bank and proudly talking about the success of his business and what a wonderful and intelligent man he was, he still didn't feel comfortable. They were surrounded by junior and senior vice presidents, over a hundred and their spouses. They were all dressed straight out of the Preppy's RU store. Designer chinos, custom-made blue button-down Oxford shirts, and thousand-dollar Italian loafers with no socks. The women were dressed the same way, in light cotton blouses, pleated shorts or capri pants, leather sandals, and expensive jewelry. And here was Brad, 
in dockers and a golf shirt with a Citizen EcoDrive watch, not a Rolex. Jennifer, however, didn't notice or care. She still proudly showed it off to her co-workers at work, hand in hand with Ben, and chatted easily with each of them. Ben, she said, meet Susan Flowers and her husband Clark. Ben turned his head and his eyes widened. Hi, Ben, Clark Flowers said, extending his perfectly manicured hand and shaking it firmly. Clark Flowers. Ben shook the outstretched hand, but his gaze was still fixed on Susan Flowers. Ben, honey, Jennifer giggled, you're staring. He cleared his throat and tried to laugh, but it came out as some kind of choked gurgle. I know, Clark said. Unusual, isn't it? Ben nodded. Susan Flowers and Jennifer could have been twins. Almost the same height, about 5'6", both slender, blue-eyed, with short blonde hair. See anything you like? Susan laughed, reached out and shook Ben's hand. His gaze traveled down her body, then turned and looked Jennifer over from head to toe. Wow, he said. Were you separated at birth? They all laughed. Sometimes it makes it hard to work in the office, Susan said. People mistake us for each other all the time. And I think Jennifer takes advantage of that sometimes, don't you, dear? She put her hand on Jennifer's forearm. Jennifer grinned back. If they want to think that the senior vice president is in charge of the audit and not the little junior vice president, who am I to embarrass them? Come on, girl, Clark said. Oh, honey, look, Susan said, pointing over Ben's shoulder. Ben turned to follow her finger as she spoke. This is Alan from Commercial Paper. I wanted to introduce you two, remember? Of course, Clark said, turned to Ben and nodded, then followed his wife. Who's Alan? said Ben, turning to Jennifer again. She hesitated before answering. He has some bad news, she whispered. Ben shifted his gaze to Broussard again. How so? Just bad news. Stay away from him. He nodded. Who's the bad news? Came a loud voice. Oh, Ben, Jennifer said, pulling his arm to get his attention. It's Mr. Jensen. Please, Jennifer, it's Horace, he said. Ben looked at the man standing in front of him, the president and CEO of Jensen National Bank. He was short, an inch or so shorter than Jennifer, and built like a block. He had a full head of silver hair, a swarthy face with a deep tan, a square jawline to match his square frame, and twinkling hazel-colored eyes. Ben determined his age to be 60, but he could have been 10 years old or less. Either way, he looked in good shape, sturdy and strong for such a short man. And unlike all the other men, he was dressed in faded Levi's and a Chicago Bulls jersey. Horace, Jennifer said. This is my husband, Benjamin Bradford. Benjamin, Jensen said, squeezing Ben's hand with an iron grip. I'm Horace Jensen. It's a pleasure to finally meet the man behind the continued happiness of our little Jennifer. Please, sir, Ben said. This is Ben. And I'm glad to finally meet the only man who appears to have realized what a special woman Jennifer is. Jensen raised an eyebrow. Huh? Yeah, Ben continued. I knew she was special from the first time I met her, but you have thousands of employees and you still managed to advance her through the ranks faster than most, so I know you noticed it too. Jensen grinned, and Jennifer tapped her fist on his arm. That's enough, Ben, she said, though the delight in her eyes said otherwise. What do you do for a living, Ben? Jensen said, taking a sip of his drink. I'm a system security analyst. Jensen's eyebrows rose. And what does a system security analyst do? Ben cleared his throat. Well, sir, we hack into secure computer systems. So you're a professional hacker? Something like that. Ben said, taking a sip of his beer before continuing. We get hired by companies, mostly banks, but other companies too, to try and hack into their computer systems. We approach them from different angles to see how secure their systems are. The theory is that if we can't do it, you're probably safe from others. If we can get in, however, we work with the company to develop protocols and defenses. Jensen nodded and thought for a moment before he spoke. Can you wait here for a minute? Sure, Ben said. Honey! Jennifer whispered in his ear. I think you've got his attention. That would be nice, Ben said, turning around and seeing the look on her face. It was hard to read. Was she excited? Nervous. I promise, he said. I won't embarrass you, okay? She nodded. I know, baby. Ben, Jensen said, returning with a tall, thin, dark-haired man in his thirties. Ben, this is Jeff Richards, head of electronic security. Ben and Richards shook hands. He looks nervous, Ben thought. Richard's gaze stopped on Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer, he murmured. Hi, Jeff, she said. Ben's a systems analyst, Jensen said. Have you ever heard of such a thing? Sure, Richards replied. They're hired to assess the integrity of a security system. We have one? Richards shook his head. Just me and our people, he said, 
looking at Ben with irritation. He thinks his men are enough, Ben thought. You think that's enough? queried Jensen, reading Ben's mind. Before Jensen could answer, Ben intervened. No, he said, it's never enough. Seeing the flash of anger on Richards's face, Ben continued. Look, I'm sure you're more than qualified. Hell, you're probably better at your job than I am. The problem is that you're only looking at this from your own perspective, how to keep the system secure. No doubt you're up to date on all the new tricks. You read manuals and publications and make the necessary changes. But there's a problem with that. Richards glared at him, but Jensen was intrigued, mulling over what Ben had said. Ben realized he'd caught on and waited a moment before continuing. The problem is, Ben said, the new hacking technique already happened before anyone had time to publicize information about it. Jensen nodded, agreeing with the conclusion. Makes sense, don't you think? He nudged Richards, who now looked like a spring about to unravel. Yeah, he squeaked, clearing his throat before continuing. Yeah, that makes sense. But how will we know when you do? And that you won't ruin anything if you manage to get in. Ben laughed. Because I'm giving you a full inspection report, he said. And because if I mess anything up or get caught doing anything illegal, I'll lose my business and end up in jail. That's why. Your business, said Jensen. You're self-employed? Ben nodded. Sure, I have employees. Four of them. All professionals, all highly skilled, and all honest as the day is long. Mr. Jensen, we're good at what we do, and I recommend you give it a try. Ben looked at Jennifer, who smiled at him before he continued. If you don't want to use our services or feel that our charges are inappropriate, I still recommend that you hire someone to audit your system. I'll be happy to recommend some very good firms for you. Jensen smiled at him. I don't think that will be necessary, son, he said. He pulled a business card out of his pocket and held it out to Ben. Call me on Monday and we'll set up a time to meet and discuss all the details. But I like what I'm hearing, and I'd prefer it to be in-house. Wouldn't you, Jennifer? She hugged Jensen, who at first was confused by the sudden display of emotion. Thank you, Horace. You won't be disappointed, I promise. What was the expression Ben saw on Richard's face when Jennifer hugged Jensen? Was it anger? Jealousy? Lust? He couldn't tell, but it made him nervous. He watched Richards walk across the lawn to Broussard and Susan Flowers. When all three were together, Richard spoke, and Ben saw three pairs of eyes turn and stare at him. He turned away, embarrassed at being caught. Jennifer walked through the front door and placed her purse on the counter near the closet. I'm home, she called out when she heard voices in the back of the house. Family room, Ben called out. Mommy, the twins shouted in unison, and she heard their clumsy footsteps as they ran after her. Hi, little ones, she said, reaching down and taking a twin in each hand. Ashley and I are reading, Allison said. Really? Jennifer replied, turning to Ashley. Is that true? Ashley nodded solemnly. Horton's book. Horton hears who? Ashley nodded again and whispered, It's my favorite. Not me, Allison shrieked. I like Sam Ya. And I like them both, Jennifer agreed. Good, Ben smiled, walking over and taking Ashley from her arms. Then you can read green eggs and ham to them before bedtime. Jennifer smiled as he leaned over and kissed her cheek. They made their way to the kitchen to eat dinner. How was work, honey? He asked behind her back. Long. She glanced at the clock on the stove. 8.10. You knew being lieutenant governor meant longer hours, he said. He put Ashley in her high chair and pulled it up to the table, then turned and looked at her fondly. You know, you don't have to keep doing this. She gave him a tired smile. I know, Ben. I want to be with you. She pulled Allison tighter against her. And with you, you little monster. Allison giggled, wiggling as she was settled into her high chair. But that'll last another six or eight months. Then I'll sort out my systems and my job and everything. Then I'll get my life back. We'll get our lives back. He only nodded, then turned to clear the plates and serve the food. They'd been talking about this for a year now, and she knew Ben was losing patience. But if he was patient for a little longer, ten months, things would settle down, and they could get back to normal. What did Teresa have in store for us today? She asked, trying to lighten the mood. Tamal pie, he replied, putting the casserole into plates. Jennifer laughed. You really need to ask her to cook a simple meal every once in a while. All that Mexican food gives me an ulcer. Ben placed plates in front of the girls and both began shoveling food into their mouths. He turned and put his arm around Jennifer and said, They don't seem to mind. Besides, that's what you get when you hire a Latino nanny. Mexican food and bilingual kids. Next time I'll hire a French nanny, she murmured in his ear, hugging him back and enjoying the way he hugged her. No problem, he said, 
leaning over and running his lips and tongue over her ear. French is good, she heard him chuckle as the electric shocks from his lips traveled through her brain. You men are all pigs, she laughed, pushing him away and carrying their plates to the table. When she sat down, she wrinkled her nose in pain. Ben noticed her grimace and raised his eyebrows. Fell at work, she explained. Wet spot on the floor. I took a hard hit and I think I bruised my tailbone. Are you okay? She heard the tone and saw sympathy flash across his face. I'll be fine, she assured him. Just give me a few days before our next training. He smirked. Okay, but just a few days. She smiled back and started on her food. So did you go out with Mr. Jensen today? She asked. He nodded, smirking. And? His grin grew even wider. I got it. I'll get started soon as soon as I get some things sorted out and get the team together for briefings. How soon? She asked. He shook his head. I won't tell you. I don't want you to accidentally give anyone away. Fair enough, she said, pushing her unfinished plate aside. But you got a good deal? He nodded enthusiastically. Oh yes, we got a good deal. A really good deal. Don't be too greedy, dear, she warned. Remember, I work there. He laughed. It wasn't me, he said. Jensen probably spent the whole weekend on the phone. He had rates from everyone else, knew how much they all charged. When he found out I was less, he started insisting on a higher rate. I tried to argue with him, but he insisted. Said if I did a good job, he would pay me a fair price. If he wasn't happy, he'd pay a lower rate. Standard rate. But he'd pay top rate if he considered the work top rate. Some sort of bonus, I suppose. Her eyes widened. And you think you can give him top grade? He nodded. I guarantee it. Jeff Richards watched on the monitor as Benjamin Bradford exited the elevator and headed for his wife's desk. He watched as she smiled at him and Ben leaned over and kissed her cheek. She stroked his hair and whispered something to him. He laughed and Richards wished he had a sound tracker. Keep an eye on him, Richards ordered the man and woman sitting in front of the monitors. Take notes. Wherever he goes in this building, I want to know it. They nodded and began taking notes. He's a security specialist, Richards continued. If he breaks into this system, we could all be out of a job. Understood? They nodded, began to write faster and stare more intently at the screen. They watched Ben circle the room with his eyes, saying something to Jennifer, who was getting off the computer and reaching for her purse. Then they watched Ben go from monitor to monitor, leaving Jennifer at her desk to finish logging out. They then watched closely as Jennifer gave him a tour of her department before walking him back to the elevator where he exited. Finally, they watched as Ben and Jennifer exited the elevator on the first floor and left the building. None of the three paid any attention to the short African-American janitor who pulled his cart into a storage room and disappeared for 12 minutes before reappearing and shuffling down the hall toward the other offices. Ben sat in his workshop office and stared intently at the computer screen. Ron Washington had plugged a palm-sized computer into the system lines running through the storeroom, and this little marvel of modern technology was now transmitting data to Jeff's office computer. He stood at the portal to the system, trying to decide the best way to start. First, he had to choose a target. Whose password should he look for by penetrating the system? He smiled. Broussard, the arrogant, smirking asshole that Jennifer had told him was bad news. Well, thought Ben, let's see how true those rumors are. In the username, he typed in Broussard. The computer told him it didn't recognize the username. He typed in A. Broussard. Again, no recognition. He nodded. This was standard. In a company as big as Jensen National, there could be as many Smiths as you wanted, and almost as many Smiths with the same initials. The only question was how many initials to use for a name. System security rarely worried about username security. They almost always concentrated on password security. After four more attempts, he finally had a full name, Alain Broussard. Now came the hard part, cracking Broussard's password. He chose the most obvious way. He simply called technical support and asked to verify the password. Such calls came in dozens of times a day, and the help desk regularly issued them over the phone. Still, if the call was unsuccessful, or if the help desk had an extra layer of security, such as they would insist on walking up to Broussard's terminal and typing the password in front of him before confirming it, Ben would thereby let Richards know that he was already in the system. So Ben decided to start simple with a hybrid password attack. The simplest password attack was a dictionary attack, where almost every word in the dictionary was displayed on the login screen until the password was found and login was obtained. Dictionary attacks worked well in home system intrusions, where users rarely cared about security and needed simpler passwords to remember in the future. Unfortunately, 
Dictionary attacks almost never worked on corporate systems because corporations are much more concerned about security. Nevertheless, the user must be able to memorize the password. So corporate passwords usually consist of words connected to numbers or keyboard characters. Hybrid attack programs are designed to work with just such passwords. They bombard the system with millions of combinations of letters, numbers, and symbols until a login is obtained. Depending on the complexity of the password, such a hybrid attack can take several days. Ben decided to wait until 6 p.m., the end of the workday, before launching the hybrid attack. Otherwise, there was a good chance that Broussard was still logging into the computer and the system would be alerted to the double login attempt. Although double logins were not that uncommon, people often stayed on the system while eating lunch and logged in from a remote laptop while eating. Ben guessed that Richards would keep track of such double logins, especially at times when they would be infrequent. Ben inserted the disk into the computer and ran the hybrid attack program. He entered Broussard's username, set the time parameters, and left the office, locking the door behind him. Time to wait. Ben and Jennifer walked hand in hand to their bedroom, closing the door behind them. The girls had been put to bed, and Jennifer no longer mused. How about a little calisthenics? She suggested. The next morning, after having breakfast with Jennifer and the girls, Ben went to his office while Jennifer walked to her car to spend another day at the workplace. Turning on the media library before starting work, he smiled as he heard Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Bank Band begin a wistful rendition of the song Thunder Road. A good sign, he thought, starting the day with one of his favorite songs. Sitting at the main terminal, he sipped his coffee, jiggling the mouse with his left hand to bring the screen out of screensaver mode. He looked at the blinking display on the screen. What a damned simpleton, Ben thought. He'd used his name with 123 appended as the password. The program probably hacked it an hour after he started it. Ben began typing notes on another computer that would form the basis of his final report. These people definitely needed password protection training in addition to their internal security measures. Ben then began navigating the system, trying to see how far he could go. He started with inner office memos and correspondence, all of which he hacked into easily. He scanned the emails, clicking back and forth. Feeling mischievous, he decided to send Jennifer an email from Broussard. Hey babe, guess who? He typed. A little over a minute later, he saw the reply. I told you not to email me. J. Ben felt uneasy. Was the bastard really harassing her? He decided to take the time to investigate, but first he needed to cover his tracks. He didn't want anyone to suspect him of that, including Jennifer. Sorry. Wrong addressee. Uh. Jennifer didn't respond. So Ben went back to Broussard's email and began to delve into the story. Eight months ago, Ben had seen a series of emails that raised questions for him. Investigating further, he focused on finding clues, his fingers flying across the keyboard as he dug through the system. Three hours later, he found the entire trail and was amazed at the simplicity of the scheme. He downloaded copies of the lines of code to an external hard drive, as well as several emails that indirectly mentioned the hoax. Unsure that he had the full picture, Ben went back to the list of emails that had originally tipped him off. The emails had ended abruptly, but Ben was well aware that the massive theft was still going on. Maybe he's running it from another account, Ben speculated, and scrolled through the emails looking for other addresses to look for. An hour later, Ben logged into Broussard's home email account. The idiot had used the same password at home that he used at work, and Ben's breath caught. How could a man so devilishly intelligent and so far unaffected be so incredibly careless? Didn't he realize how easy it was to get to this shit? Through Broussard's home email, Ben hacked into his home computer and began his search. He found a gold mine in a file labeled Banking. In that file were thousands of transactions over the past eight months, transferring about $6 million into offshore accounts. In another folder, Ben found the passwords to all the offshore accounts, which made him laugh out loud. Was there really no limit to this idiot's ignorance of computer security? Considering who he was working with, Ben had by now identified Jeff Richards as one of the two remaining co-conspirators. You'd think someone should have warned him about this. Ben heard a knock on the door. Come in, he called out, closing the door out of sight. Teresa entered the room carrying a small plate with a sandwich and an apple on it. I thought you might be hungry, Mr. Bradford, she said, placing the plate on the table in front of him. You haven't eaten since breakfast. He glanced at his watch. It was 4.10, more than nine hours had passed since he'd eaten a piece of toast with strawberry jam. Bouncing from the caffeine running through his veins and what he'd discovered, Ben hadn't noticed how late it was getting and how hungry he was. Thanks, Teresa, he said, 
reaching for a sandwich as his stomach rumbled in anticipation. Mrs. Bradford called, Teresa continued. She's staying late tonight and probably won't be home until after the girls go to bed. With his mouth full of food, Ben only nodded. Finally swallowing, he said, Okay, I'll be down shortly and we'll feed them. Teresa nodded and left, closing the door behind her. Finishing his sandwich, Ben took a bite of his apple and turned on the computer screens again. Rummaging through the file folders looking for something that caught his eye, Ben double-clicked on a video. Let's see what kind of crap he found here. There were separate folders organized by the names of different women with a number after each name. Karen 1, Julie 13, Becky 3, Susan 2, and so on. Ben looked through the list and clicked on Becky 3. The video played and the camera stopped on Broussard and a pretty blonde woman in her mid-twenties sitting on the couch. They were talking and Ben turned up the volume. Becky, I don't want to do this again. Broussard, you don't really have a choice now, do you? Becky, a tear streaming down her face. Please, Mr. Broussard, I... Broussard, call me Alain. Becky, but it's not nice, Alain. It doesn't matter what I call you. I, it's my husband. He'll never know as long as you play along. Scrolling through the video, he'd seen enough to know that it wasn't going to get any better from here. Returning to the list, Ben switched to the other videos. Some of the women were more than willing, but most not at all. Ben recognized several of the women at the various bank parties he had attended with Jennifer. He knew Susan was the woman he had met at the last party. She was the head of the audit department. He couldn't remember her last name, and the videos didn't give that possibility. Still, she would be the perfect third accomplice, and Ben made a mental note to hack into her systems and see what he could find. Scrolling back through the videos from over eight months ago, he glanced at the list of names. While he didn't feel like watching those videos again, there might be something there that would give him an idea of the identity of the third co-conspirator that Richards and Broussard had mentioned repeatedly in their emails. He knew the third party was a woman. They always referred to her in feminine terms, but there was no hint of her identity. Already about to give up, Ben flipped through a file with a name dated almost 11 months earlier. His eyes widened and he froze, afraid to click on the file. Jennifer 5. He stared at the screen for what seemed like an eternity, but in truth, no more than a minute had passed. Then, focusing on the screen, he held his breath and clicked on the file. Rebecca Lyons pulled into the underground parking garage of her apartment complex. Shutting the car off, she opened the door and checked her hair and makeup in the rearview mirror. Slicking her hair back with her fingers, she took a deep breath, grabbed her briefcase, and stepped out of the car. Looking around the well-lit parking garage, she saw no one and headed for the elevator. She listened for footsteps and looked around the parking lot, waiting for the doors to open. Once the doors opened, she hopped into the elevator, pressed the close doors button, and then 12. Her body tensed as she waited for the doors to close, and she was only able to breathe normally when the doors finally closed and the elevator began its ascent. Nine years have passed, she thought for the millionth time, and I'm still nervous. Then a strained smile played on her lips. Good, she thought, because if she had been so careful from the beginning, this would never have happened. When the doors opened on the top floor, Rebecca stepped out of the elevator, turned the corner, and bumped into someone. Excuse me, she said, instinctively clutching her briefcase to her. Rebecca, the man said, and she nearly fainted. Eight years later, she still recognized his soft intonation when he said her name. Ben? She looked up at him. Sure enough, Benjamin Bradford in the flesh. Same trim figure, same short-cropped hair slicked to the side, same deep brown eyes, same faded jeans worn tennis shoes and t-shirt. If it weren't for a few streaks of gray hair, which she realized seemed premature for a man in his early thirties, and the expression on his face, he hadn't changed a bit in eight years. Rebecca, he said, I need your help. Her face tensed. How did you get here? She demanded. This building is guarded. He cleared his throat, his expression growing more desperate. I know someone who lives here. An old client. They let me in. What do you want? Help, he repeated. I need your help. She studied his face. She'd never seen him like this before. In all the years they had been dating, the four best years of her life followed by one of the worst, she had never seen him scared. She realized that was exactly what he looked like now. Frightened and lost. It made her angry. Of course you need my help, she said, pushing him away as she headed for her door. Where were you when I needed your help? Huh? Can you answer that question for me? And now you need my help? She heard him follow as she unlocked the door. It's not fair, Rebecca, he pleaded. You know it wasn't like that. I was there for you. I tried my best, you know that. She pressed herself against the door. 
He was right. He'd done his best. And he would have continued if she herself hadn't forced him away and ended the relationship. That night had broken her. And after eight months of Ben patiently trying to fix her, she realized she wasn't going to get better. Therapy. Love. Nothing could get that terrible night out of her mind as long as she lived. So she did the hardest thing she'd ever had to do. Even harder than reliving that night and its aftermath. She'd forced the only man she'd ever loved to leave her. Come in, she whispered, opening the door and walking into her apartment. She turned on the lights and headed towards her bedroom. Sit down and relax while I get out of this monkey suit. Five minutes later, Rebecca was back in the living room, feeling much more comfortable in her sweatshirt and loose jeans. She walked past Ben, who was sitting on the couch, and headed for the kitchen. Do you want something to eat or drink? she asked. Hearing no answer, she picked up a can of Diet Pepsi, opened it, and returned to the living room. Ben was hunched over on the couch, resting his head on his hands. Ben, she said, settling into the chair across from him. What's wrong? I need your help. Why me? He coughed, and a wheeze full of irritation could be heard in his cough. You'll understand when you find out what's going on. What he's doing to them. He lifted his gaze from his hands and looked at her, anger now blazing in his eyes and curving in his mouth. Who? Who's doing what to whom? His face returned to his hands before he answered. I want to hire you. Only after you agree can I tell you. His voice broke, and he was on the verge of tears. Rebecca felt her composure, her cold exterior begin to melt at the sight and sound of his voice. She lowered her voice. Ben, come on, is that Jennifer? Girls? She heard a suppressed sob, but couldn't tell if it was Jennifer or the girls. Placing the soda on the coffee table, she got up from the chair and walked over to the couch, hesitant to sit next to him. It had been like this since that night, especially after Ben left. She'd had to force herself to tolerate human contact, to not flinch at the most casual of touches. And yet it was crumbling before her eyes, and she couldn't think of anything else to do. Sitting down on the couch beside him, she put a hand on his shoulder. Ben, she encouraged, you have to tell me what you want. I can't help you if you don't tell me. When he said nothing, she added, Okay, consider me hired. We'll talk details later. He looked up, saw that she was serious, and began to speak. Softly and with feeling at first, but by the end it was dull and monotonous. An hour later, Rebecca could only stare with her mouth hanging open as Ben finished telling her about the whole deception. But not a minute later he stopped talking, signaling that the story was over, and her lawyer turned on her. She clicked the latches of her briefcase, pulled out a pen and notepad, and began writing a plan. Okay, Ben, she said. You wanted my help, and now you're going to get it. The pace of her writing picked up as her anger grew. And I'm not going to give you a choice. We're going to burn their asses and burn them good. Two weeks later, Richard sat across from Broussard in the executive dining room. We may have a problem, he said, looking around to make sure no one was eavesdropping. Broussard set his fork aside and slowed his chewing. He could be in the system, Richards continued. There are some strange logins. Strange timing, unrecorded double lodgings, snooping through the usual folders. Broussard cut off a piece of carrot and put it in his mouth, chewing methodically and looking at Richards. When he swallowed, he spoke. Any indication that he accessed any files related to this enterprise? Richards shrugged. I can't say for sure. He might have, but the chances are slim. Hell, there are millions of files on the system, and the odds of him just stumbling across this one are slim to none. Still, are you sure there's no trace of it anywhere else? Traces? asked Broussard. What kind of traces? Richards leaned toward him. Well, you know, any communications with... Someone else, uh... Broussard's eyes narrowed as he pondered the question. No, he finally uttered. We never took notes. Hell, we haven't even talked in months in any way, shape, or form. Richard sighed, feeling the tension leave his body. And you don't keep any trace of that anywhere else? Broussard hesitated before answering. No, of course not. Richards knew he was lying. For the first time since this had all started, he felt an aching emptiness in his stomach. Just make sure you don't, he said. Across town, Rebecca picked up her office phone. Rebecca Lyons, she said. Done, Ben said. She smiled. This was going to be fun. Two days later, Jeff Richards was surprised to hear a knock on the door. It was only six, and she wasn't due until half an hour later. She usually couldn't stay out late on Fridays, but he knew it wouldn't be long. What was so important you had to see today? She asked nonchalantly, walking past him as he closed the door. We have a problem, he said. She turned, and he saw anger flash across her face. What kind of problem? Broussard, Richard said. He didn't listen to everything I told him. About security. 
Her eyes narrowed. How do you know? Richard smiled. Because I hacked into his accounts, he said. Both at the office and at home. And? And he has enough funds there to put us all in jail for a very long time, Richard said, his voice breaking with the anger that had come over him. She slammed her purse on the table. That damn idiot, she hissed. And there's more, Richard said, stepping closer to her. Like what? Like the video, Richard said, grabbing her hand and squeezing it tightly. Her eyes widened. Didn't know he likes to videotape his sessions with you, did you? He saw the realization flash across her face and squeezed her hand tighter. Let me go, she said, trying to break free of his tight grip. Oh, he's videotaping his sessions with all of them. Or rather, with all 24 of you. But the ones with you I really liked. She was already struggling, trying to pull away from him, but he kept talking. I especially liked the last one, he continued. The one where you and he plotted to trick me into helping you. It wasn't like that, she pleaded. It was exactly like that, he thundered. I watched the video. I heard you laughing at me. He pushed her onto the couch. That's all I was to you? Another douchebag? Did I even mean anything to you? Tears were streaming down her face now. In the beginning, you didn't. But now you do. I don't see him anymore. It's just you. You're all I need and you know it. Richards paused in his anger. She was convincing and he wanted to believe her. And she was right. There were no more videos of Broussard from then on. They were never together again, of that he was sure. Given Broussard's predilection for recording his conquests, he was sure there would have been more if she'd continued. You know it's true, she wailed. Look at me, Jeff. You know it's true, don't you? Maybe not right away, but it's true now. Is it true? Against his will, he felt his head nod in agreement. It was the truth. It had to be true. Because if it wasn't, there would be no point in continuing. No matter what. That's not all, he said. Her crying subsided, and she brushed the tears off her cheeks. What do you mean? The money, he said. They're gone. Gone? He nodded. That damn bastard, she shrieked, grabbed her purse, and flew out the door. Richard stared after her, again not realizing whether she was doing him or the money. Ben rolled over onto his back and looked at the alarm clock. A little after six, time to get up. He rolled out of bed and headed to the bathroom to relieve himself, then brushed his teeth and shaved. Back in the bedroom, he nudged the sleeping woman under the covers. She had come in late the night before, well after he had gone to bed, though he had pretended to be asleep when she snuck under the covers. Honey, he whispered, do you want to take a shower together? She mumbled in response and snuggled tighter into the blanket. He decided to let her sleep and headed for the shower. After showering and getting himself cleaned up, he was buttoning his shirt when the doorbell rang. 6.30 on a Saturday morning, who the hell could it be? He trotted down the stairs and went to the door. When he opened it, he saw a middle-aged man in a rumpled suit, a mask of fatigue on his face. He held out a badge to Ben, and behind him stood three uniformed police officers. Mr. Bradford? The man in the suit said. Ben nodded. Is Mrs. Bradford home? Ben paused. Why? Because we'd like to talk to her, he said. And you are? Detective Dale Robertson. And what do you want to talk to Jennifer about, Detective? Ben, honey, who's there? He heard from behind him. He turned as Jennifer came down the stairs. It's the police, he said. They want... Jesus, what the hell happened to you? Jennifer flinched, but it did little to hide her battered face. Jennifer, he insisted, what happened to your face? From behind him, Ben heard sighs. Apparently, the officers had noticed the marks. Did your husband do this to you, ma'am? said Detective Robinson. Jennifer, without saying a word, ran back down the stairs. Ben started to chase after her when the detective's command to stop made him freeze. Did you do this to her? asked Robinson. Ben shook his head. Of course I didn't. Jesus Christ, do you think I could have hit my wife? What the hell? When was the last time you saw her before now? Continued Robinson. Ben thought for a moment before he spoke. Why are you here, detective? Please answer my question, Robinson said. Ben shook his head. I don't think so. He looked over his shoulder toward the stairs, then turned to Robinson again. I'm going to have to ask you to leave. Robinson grinned. That won't do. We need to talk to your wife, and right now. You have a warrant? snapped Ben. Robinson pressed his lips together. We don't need a warrant. You're wrong, detective. This is my house and her house, and we're in it. You can't come in here without a warrant, and you can't take her out without a warrant. You know that, and I know that. All right, Robinson said. We'll get your warrant. And we'll leave someone here to make sure you don't leave. But Mr. Bradford? 
he cast a glance at Ben, who answered him in the same way. I won't forget how you made things so complicated, okay? In response, Ben slammed the door shut. Robinson walked back to the Broussard house and entered the room, noticing that the pathologist was recording body temperatures on a chart and the forensics team was just finishing assembling their equipment. Anything during my absence? He asks, addressing no one in particular. Probable cause of death, the coroner said, still taking notes. Bled out. Holy shit. And this, one of the techs said. Thought you might be interested in this. Robinson walked over to the desk and looked at the computer screen. We were cleaning the desktop and the mouse for fingerprints and hit the mouse. This appeared on the screen. The technician clicked the mouse and the screen lit up. Robinson saw the coroner rise up from the body, then looked up and saw the same thing. Looked down, then up again. He set this place up on video? Yeah, the tech said, grinning. It was set up last night? When did it happen? The technician shrugged. Don't know, haven't checked. Not my area of expertise. Just thought you might find it interesting. Oh, I find it interesting, Robinson said. Pulled out his cell phone and called computer services to have them come to the scene. What's going on? asked Rebecca as she walked through the front door. I'll tell you the whole story later, Ben said. But right now the cops were here and they want to question Jennifer. About what? They didn't say. But probably about what we talked about last night. Rebecca's face tensed as she tossed her jacket onto the couch. Where's Jennifer? Upstairs. Ben pointed to the landing. Last door on the right. Have you talked to her since they left? He shook his head. She locked the door and won't let me in. Rebecca nodded. Stay here, she ordered. Maybe she'll feel more comfortable just talking to me. Ben bit his lower lip and nodded. Jennifer, Rebecca said, knocking on the door. Jennifer, I'm Rebecca Lyons. I'm an attorney and I need to talk to you. She didn't hear a response. Jennifer, please let me in. Ben isn't here, he's downstairs. It's just going to be you and me here, okay? Please, Jennifer, we don't have much time. She heard soft footsteps, then the doorknob clicked and the door opened. May I come in? asked Rebecca. Jennifer came back in and sat down on the bed without saying anything. She just looked at Rebecca, who gasped when she saw Jennifer's face. Jennifer, the police were here. Jennifer didn't answer anything. Do you know what they want? After a moment, Jennifer nodded slowly, as if in a trance. Can you tell me what happened to you? Jennifer turned to face Rebecca and nodded again. Then a tear ran down her cheek and she leaned over to Rebecca and hugged her tightly. Calm down, Rebecca whispered stroking Jennifer's back as she felt the wet tears penetrate her blouse at her shoulder. Jennifer, you have to be strong. The police will be back any minute and I need to know what happened. Okay? She felt Jennifer nod, pressing herself against her shoulder. Then the embrace loosened. After a moment, Jennifer leaned back in her chair and began to talk. Thirty minutes later, Jennifer finished her story. Rebecca could only sit, stunned, while a whirlwind of feverish activity swirled in her head. No sooner had she made a plan of action, then she heard the doorbell ring and realized that the time to make a decision was now. Robinson waited patiently while the dark-haired lawyer read the warrant. She's beautiful, he thought, but wounded. There was something about her that made him wary of people, hesitant to touch them. She only felt comfortable around Bradford, he realized. Best to put that aside for later. All right, detective, she said, handing him back the warrant. Please proceed. But Rebecca, Ben said behind her. There's nothing we can do, Ben, she said. It's okay. Robinson smiled. Told you I'd be back, handsome. He tapped Ben on the shoulder with the warrant as he walked by and led five uniformed officers and three technicians to the crime scene at the back of the house. The officers and techs spread out, going into different parts of the house. Robinson followed their actions and then turned to face Rebecca and Ben. Where's Mrs. Bradford? he asked. Upstairs, Ben replied. Will she be joining us? This question he addressed to Rebecca. No, she won't be joining us. Rebecca replied. She's had a very traumatic time and it's better for her to rest. You know, Robinson said, realizing he was wasting his breath. If she would just answer a few questions, we could leave these people alone. Rebecca shook her head. That won't do, detective. You should know that Mrs. Bradford is represented by an attorney, me, and she won't answer any questions until I get there. Okay? Robinson nodded, trying to let his blood pressure drop again. Damn lawyers. Detective he heard to his right. Looking that way, he saw a technician coming from the garage with a camera in front of him. Right here, he said, showing Robinson the picture on the digital camera. Just as we suspected. Robinson looked at the snapshot and sure enough, this was it. 
Along the driver's side door was a long scratch through the paint and metal, almost the entire length of the door. He smiled. Gotcha, Mrs. Bradford. Alfaro, he called out. Yes, replied a uniformed sergeant from the other room. You're in charge here until I get back, okay? Understood. And sergeant, he called out, turning to look at Rebecca and Ben. Don't let Mrs. Bradford leave. If she takes one step outside that door, handcuff her and lead her into the house. Understood? Understood, Sergeant Alfaro said as he entered the room. We'll play it your way, Miss Lyons, Robinson said, not trying to contain his glee. Wait here until I get back with the arrest warrant, okay? Rebecca only yawned in response. Please don't take too long, detective, she said. Her mocking tone made his blood pressure rise again. Then he had two thoughts one after the other. First, I'll wipe that smirk off your face, counselor. And second, what does she know that I don't? She plays it awfully cool even for a lawyer. The second thought gnawed at Robinson even as he drove back to the Bradford house with the warrant in the seat beside him. What does she know that I don't? Lake County State's attorney Robert Knight was dressed in his best suit and tie. He was in the middle of a tight race for state's attorney, and he needed a public show of law and order to help himself reach a third term. The case of the people of the state of Illinois v. Jennifer Bradford was going to be just such a vehicle, he decided when the case was brought to his office. To that end, he made the decision to personally handle the case from start to finish. The courtroom was filled with spectators and press, and Knight smiled. He knew things were shaping up just right. The more cases like this, the better his chances. All that remained was to make sure he would be convicted quickly. He nodded in thought. Murder trials could drag on for two years, and that would be too late for his purposes. He had to do everything he could to expedite the process as quickly as possible. The primaries were four months away and the election was 13 months away. If he could get the case to trial by the end of the summer, he would create a wave of momentum that would propel him to power. All rise, the bailiff commanded, and there was silence in the courtroom except for the shuffling of hundreds of bodies rising to their feet. The circuit court of the 19th Judicial Circuit is now in session, with the Honorable Judge Gerald Feldman presiding. Knight smiled as the judge walked through the door from the chambers to the bench and took a seat, and the bailiff informed everyone that they could take their seats as well. Knight was glad the case had been assigned to Judge Feldman. In his 17th year on the bench, he was known as a no-nonsense law and order judge. Of course, Knight knew he could give the lawyers hell if they blundered, but he would do his best to get this show on the road. Is the defendant here? asked Feldman to the bailiff. I'll take her out, Your Honor. Feldman nodded, and all eyes followed the bailiff to a side door. A moment later, Jennifer walked through the door wearing an orange jumpsuit labeled Lake County Jail, orange tennis shoes with no laces on her feet. People v. Bradford, case number 09-CF-2311, Feldman said in a bored voice as he flipped through the file folder in front of him. Counsel for the state, please identify yourself. Robert Knight on behalf of the people of the state of Illinois, Knight said, his deep voice rumbling throughout the courtroom. Counsel for the defendant? Rebecca Lyons of Schwartz Gilman, Your Honor. Feldman turned to the dark-haired woman sitting next to him. He noticed for the first time that she was just as beautiful as her client, but in a diametrically opposite way. Whereas Jennifer was of average height, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, slender, athletic build, Rebecca Lyons was a few inches shorter, brown-haired, brown-eyed, with a petite physique. Miss Lyons, Feldman pronounced, looking over his glasses. Does your client waive the reading of the indictment? Yes, Your Honor. Excellent. How does she plead guilty to the only count of the indictment, first-degree murder? Not guilty, Your Honor. A murmur went up in the courtroom. Reporters' pens scribbled on notepads. Quiet, the bailiff called out, and the murmuring subsided. Feldman smiled at the bailiff and continued. What's the state's position on bail? Knight cleared his throat, wanting to make sure he could be heard throughout the room. Given the seriousness of the charges, the state requests that the defendant be remanded in custody pending trial. A murmur went up again, and Feldman glanced at the crowd, which fell silent. Miss Lyons? Your Honor, Mrs. Bradford has close ties to this community. She has a family, very young twin girls, and a husband who is also connected to this community. She is not a flight risk. We ask that bail be set at a reasonable amount. Feldman nodded, then scribbled something on the form in front of him. Bail will be set at $10 million, 10% on the bond. If she can post that amount, she'll have to surrender her passport. Knight smiled, pleased with such a high bail. Then he heard a thump and turned to his right. Jennifer Bradford fainted, and the courtroom erupted in noise. Knight's smile grew even wider. Oh yes, he knew this would definitely secure him a third term. 
Five months later, Ben was nervous, his right knee bobbing up and down as he sat in the front row five feet behind Jennifer and Rebecca. For the past four days, they'd been picking jurors, and Rebecca had assured Jennifer and him that it was a good choice. Five men and seven women. Only one of the men was unmarried, but he was engaged. And three of the women were unmarried, but that didn't matter in a self-defense suit. Ben noticed that Jennifer didn't look well. She was dressed plainly, in a white blouse and gray skirt, no makeup, her hair dull from cheap prison shampoo. Most noticeably, she was pale, gaunt, with dark circles under her eyes. Prison was definitely not agreeing with her, he realized. But then again, who could she possibly agree with, other than psychos and career criminals? Rebecca, on the other hand, was a model of firm self-confidence. She wore a black skirt and jacket over a white blouse, a simple cross necklace around her slender throat, her hair neatly styled, her eyes fixed on him as Knight finished his opening statement and returned to his seat at the council table, turning to Rebecca and raising his eyebrows. Does the defense wish to make an opening statement at this time? asked Judge Feldman from the bench. Rebecca rose. No, Your Honor, she said. If the court permits, we would like to postpone the presentation until we begin our case in chief. The court allows it, Miss Lyons, he replied. Turning to Knight, he said, I ask the state to call its first witness. Your Honor, Knight said, standing up from the podium and turning to the door at the back of the courtroom. The state wishes to call Deborah Broussard. Ben had expected this. Rebecca had explained to him how trials actually went on in the real world, the ones that weren't distorted and made for TV movies. The first witness was almost always a life and death witness. This is the witness who is called to testify that she saw the victim just before he died and he was alive. Then she saw him after death and he was dead. It seemed ridiculous, but to prove murder, it had to be testified that a living person was dead. Then the coroner had to testify that the death was caused by foul play. Then the rest of the set of witnesses had to testify that the accused was the person responsible for that death by foul play. In addition, Rebecca was telling Ben that surviving spouses are inevitably called as life and death witnesses because they immediately evoke sympathy from the jury, contempt for the scoundrel accused of ruining the poor witness's life by killing the spouse and the realization that the real person is now dead, struck down in the prime of his or her happy, idyllic life. The door was opened by the bailiff, and Deborah Broussard strode down the aisle between the seats to the bench. Knight froze in place at her appearance, and Ben turned to stare. Deborah Broussard was dressed in a sparkling array of expensive gold and diamond jewelry, a tight white pantsuit that accentuated her long legs and the glitter of her jewels. Ben realized she looked nothing like a grief-stricken widow and turned to catch Rebecca's reaction. Rebecca pursed her lips, but a glint of humor appeared in her eyes. The witness was sworn in, and Deborah took the witness stand. The first few questions were introductory. Name, address, occupation, how long have you lived? Have you been married? To whom? When do you have children? Then the fireworks began. Mrs. A. Broussard, before the late afternoon of September 23rd, when did you last see your husband? asked Knight, beginning the questioning on the principle of, he was alive. September 21st, she replied, and a hint of a smile played on her lips. Ben saw Rebecca's focus on the witness, and he was as curious as he was about the grief-stricken widow's strange reaction. You mean the 22nd, don't you? said Knight, flipping through the stack of police reports lying in front of him. Objection, Rebecca said. Asked and answered. Overruled, Feldman said. The witness may answer to clear up any ambiguities. Deborah smiled at the judge, then turned to Knight again. No, Mr. Knight, I mean the 21st of the month. But you told Detective Robinson, the detective in charge of the case, earlier that you last saw him on the 22nd, didn't you? Objection, Rebecca said. He's tampering with the testimony of his own witness. Sustained. Knight paused, looked at Rebecca, then at his notes, turned the page with the list of questions and continued. So, 21st. Where were you when you saw him? At my house. You mean you and your husband's home, right, Mrs. Broussard? corrected Knight. No, Mr. Knight. I mean my house. The house belongs to me and has always belonged only to me. Ben smiled, noticing that the jurors were mesmerized by her demeanor, and at least one of the men on the jury smiled and nodded. She was definitely not playing the role of the grieving widow very well. Now, Mrs. Broussard, you last saw your husband at your home on the 21st. Was he alive at that time? She snorted. You might say so, Mr. Knight. But if you want clarification, perhaps you should ask that slut he was busy undressing. Ben almost laughed out loud, and several members of the jury stifled their laughter, while a few others turned to Knight to catch his reaction. 
Silence, Judge Feldman progressed, drowning out the loud murmurs from the gallery. Having achieved silence, he turned to Knight and, suppressing a smirk, said, Please continue, Mr. Knight. Knight swallowed, then scrawled a series of questions with a pen. Finally reaching one he liked, he asked, Okay, after the 21st of the month, when was the last time you saw your husband? Er, the other. When was the next time you saw him? About 10.30 on the 23rd, lying in the middle of the floor of his den about five feet from where I had last seen him two days before. And what was his condition at that moment? Deborah raised her eyebrows. Of course he was dead. Knight looked at the witness, not knowing whether to continue. After a moment, he said, There are no further questions for this witness, Your Honor. With those words, Knight closed the three-ring binder of questions, tucked it under his arm, and headed for the attorney's desk. Miss Lyons, Judge Feldman said as he finished his notes. Does the defense have any questions for Mrs. Broussard? We do, Your Honor, Rebecca said, rising to her feet and heading toward the jury box. Unlike Knight, who remained chained to the podium in the center of the courtroom, Rebecca leaned against the jury box. Ben saw each juror's eyes turn to her, waiting for the first question. Miss Broussard, Rebecca said when all eyes stopped on her. I would like to take this opportunity to express my condolences for the loss of your husband. Deborah nodded. I'm sure this is very difficult for you, Rebecca continued. Deborah snorted. I'm actually handling it quite well. Several of the female jurors, including all three unmarried women, smiled at the remark. Ben knew they were thinking about sparing Alain Broussard from death. Miss Broussard, I have a few questions if you don't mind. Deborah nodded. You said that the last time you saw your husband, he was with another woman? Yes, with another. Ben looked at Knight, who was staring intently at the witness. His first witness had already been a disaster for the state. She had turned the entire jury against the victim and portrayed him as a first-rate scumbag. Did you know this woman? No, I hadn't seen her before. What did she look like? Deborah thought for a moment. Like most of the others, I suppose. Most of the others in his long line of women? Yes, Deborah said. Twenty to thirty, slim blonde hair. Cute. Rebecca waved her hand toward Jennifer, and Ben saw his wife tense up, feeling the stares of all the jurors. How is Mrs. Bradford? Oh, yes, Deborah said. Very much like Mrs. Bradford. And who was that woman he was with on the 21st? How did she behave? Objection, said Knight, rising to his feet. Irrelevant to the case. Miss Lyons? They opened the door on a straight line, Your Honor. I think we're allowed to explore this matter further, especially given the totality of the testimony so far and the nature of the affirmative defenses we've raised in our pleadings. Judge Feldman nodded. Overruled. Witness, please answer the question. How did the woman behave? Deborah asked. Rebecca nodded. She was crying. Your husband undressed her and she cried? Objection, Knight progressed. Overruled, Judge Feldman coined. Yes. She seemed very reluctant. She was crying, telling him it was wrong. Objection. Hearsay. That doesn't prove the allegations true, Rebecca replied. It only speaks to the woman's behavior. True. Objection overruled, Judge Feldman said. Turning to Deborah, he said, She cried and told him it was wrong. Anything else? Yes, Your Honor, she was just limping. You know, like she was a zombie. She wasn't helping him. She was just holding her arms at her sides, crying and asking him to stop. And what did you do, Mrs. Broussard? asked Rebecca. I told her to come with me. And did she go? She didn't want to. I told her she didn't have to do anything she didn't want to do, but she just sat there. I told Alain to leave her alone, but he just smirked and said she was more than willing. That it was a little game they play from time to time. He said I should sit here to see how much fun it could be. Did you call the police? Deborah lowered her eyes. No. I offered to, but the woman begged me not to. She said she'd be fine. Rebecca tapped her knuckles on the jury rail. Thank you for your honesty, Miss Broussard. Turning back to the bench, she said, I have no further questions for this witness, Your Honor. Judge Feldman nodded and turned to Knight. Mr. Knight? Do you wish to redirect the testimony? Knight cleared his throat and stood up. No, Your Honor. Then the witness is excused. Mrs. Broussard, please do not discuss your testimony with the other witnesses in the hallway. Do you understand? Deborah nodded. I won't, Your Honor. Thank you. Turning to Knight, Judge Feldman said, The state may call its next witness. Knight called Dr. Anthony Iatrola, the Lake County coroner. Ben nearly fell asleep during the dry testimony about cause of death, penetrating force, and so on and so forth. Even the photographs weren't too interesting. 
they showed Broussard curled up face down, a few pictures of scratches on his neck. On cross-examination, Rebecca focused primarily on the time of death. Dr. Iatrola suggested that death had occurred between 7 and 10 o'clock in the evening. Of course, he admitted, it could have been earlier, and certainly later. The house was equipped with a computerized thermostat that automatically changed the temperature in the house, lowering it when people were normally away and raising it when they were home. Given the fluctuations that accompanied such temperature changes, particularly the time it took for the house to heat up or cool down, it was possible to skew the time either way. Just as she returned to the lawyer's desk, her cross-examination apparently complete, Rebecca stopped and turned around. By the way, she said, I thought you said there was an artery here? Yes, said Dr. Ayatrola. An aorta, as a matter of fact. Thank you, doctor, she said, sitting down. No further questions. Detective Robinson, who had sat at the counsel table with Knight throughout the trial, took the stand next. He described how he arrived on the scene at midnight, cordoned off the crime scene, questioned Deborah Broussard, and learned about surveillance opportunities in the house. Surveillance capabilities? asked Knight. Robinson cleared his throat. Yes, sir. The house is perimeter fenced and has an electronic gate. There are cameras on the gate that record every entry and exit when the gate is touched, something to do with interference in the electrical signal or when the gate is activated. And you've reviewed the footage? Robinson nodded. It shows a dark BMW 325 entering at 723 and exiting at 752. Can you determine the color of the BMW? asked Knight. No, sir, the camera only captures black and white. Do you remember the license plate number? No, Robinson said, clearing his throat. The license plates on the front and back were covered in what appeared to be mud. We couldn't make out the license plate. Your Honor, Rebecca said, standing up. At this point, we're going to object under the best evidence rule. If they have the tape, they should produce it and let us draw our own conclusions, not let the witness simply describe their observations. Judge Feldman turned to Knight. Mr. Knight, do you have the tape? Knight glanced at Rebecca. We have it, Your Honor. But it would be a waste of time, everyone's time, if we sit here and watch it in its entirety. Miss In? Lyons? asked Judge Feldman. She shrugged. My client is facing a life sentence, Your Honor. I'm sure Mr. Knight or the other members of the jury won't mind spending 30 minutes of their time reviewing the tape on which the witness's entire investigation seems to rest. Ben saw several members of the jury nod approvingly. Judge Feldman told Knight to lay the groundwork for the tape, which he did with the help of Detective Robinson's testimony. Everyone then spent the next 30 minutes watching the tape. After a lunch break, Knight resumed his questioning of Detective Robinson. What did this tape mean to you? asked Knight of Robinson. Well, it looks like someone in a dark BMW, license plate unknown, entered the gate around 7.30 and left about half an hour later. It also looks like it was a blonde-haired woman. And finally, it looks like the driver's sidecar door made contact with the gate as she was pulling out. Knight nodded. He then briefed Robinson on further details of the investigation that night. Robinson struck up a conversation with Deborah about someone they knew in a BMW 325, especially one with blonde hair. The only names she could name were Susan Flowers and Jennifer Bradford, two of Alan's co-workers whom she had met at company parties in the past. Unable to reach either of them, he drove to the Flowers' house. No one was there, and there was no BMW in the driveway. He then drove to the Bradford's house, where he eventually found Jennifer's red BMW 325 with a long scratch on the driver's door. Were there any impact marks on the car door? Robinson shook his head. No, sir. The scratch appears to have been scuffed up. Does the scratch appear to be recent? Objection, Rebecca said. He's not qualified as an auto expert, so he can't testify as to the age of the damage to the car. I'll restate the question, Knight said before the judge could rule. Detective, he said, could you describe the scratch in more detail? Sure. It was about two feet long and down to the metal. Turning to Jennifer at her desk, he continued. The metal was shiny without a single speck of rust. Detective. When you searched the Bradford house, was any other evidence found? Yes, he said. We found a blouse with bloodstains on it. Knight turned and picked up a clear plastic bag containing a white cotton blouse. Is this the same blouse? He handed the bag to Detective Robinson, who examined it closely. Yes, Robinson finally confirmed, handing the package back to Knight. Your Honor, I would like what was previously marked as State Exhibit No. 34 for identification to be admitted into evidence as State Exhibit No. 34. No objection, Rebecca said. No objection. State Exhibit No. 34 will be admitted into evidence. I have no further questions for the witness at this time, 
Knight said. Rebecca stood up and walked over to the table where the admitted exhibits lay. She picked up the blouse and turned back to Detective Robinson. You testified that there was blood on this blouse, correct? Yes, ma'am, he said, taking the blouse. You were present during the testimony of the coroner, Dr. Iatrola, correct? Yes, ma'am. And you heard him state that the victim died as a result of a ruptured aorta, correct? Yes, ma'am. And you heard him say that arterial punctures make the blood flow fast and furious, correct? Yes, ma'am. Rebecca glanced at the blouse in Robinson's hands. What color is that blouse? White. Show me the blood on this blouse, she said, folding her arms and leaning back in the jury chair. The jury leaned forward and watched as Robinson pulled the blouse out of her bag and unfolded it. Here it is, ma'am, he said, pointing to a stain on the lower right front of the blouse. The judge clarified the location of the stain Robinson was pointing to. Then Rebecca continued. That's it, she said. She's accused of stabbing someone and puncturing their aorta, and you show me a blood stain the size of my thumb? That's all there is, ma'am. Perhaps Mrs. Bradford managed to get out of the way before the blood began to flow. Your Honor, Rebecca said, turning to face the judge. Witness, please refrain from making comments like that. Is that understood? Robinson nodded. And the jury will disregard that statement. Okay, detective, let me ask you. How many murders have you investigated in your career? Thirty-four, he answered. And how many cases of any kind, homicides, automobile accidents, suicides, and so on, have involved arterial punctures? Robinson thought for a moment. A couple dozen, I suppose. In all your experience with arterial punctures, have you seen anything to indicate that someone might just jump out from under a stream of arterial blood? No, ma'am. Rebecca nodded. And those were the only bloody clothes you found in the Bradford house? No bloody shoes? Or did she manage to fly 15 feet above the floor to escape? No, he agreed. That was it. What about the car? If she was leaving the scene of such a messy murder, surely you must have found bloodstains in the car, right? No, ma'am, there was no blood in the car either. At this, Judge Feldman adjourned until the next morning. We've got a serious problem here, Robinson remarked to Knight as they walked down the hallway to Knight's office. The hell do you think, replied Knight. She filed a notice of intent to use self-defense. And then, right off the bat, the grieving damn widow takes the stand and does everything for them. How the hell could you let that happen? Robinson's lips pressed together, and he struggled to contain his rising anger. You knew from the beginning that she had that defense. You saw the bloody videotapes that sick bastard kept. You thought his wife didn't know anything about him? Knight stopped and turned to Robinson. Not a word, he hissed. You hear me? Not a word about any damn videotapes. They'll come out and we'll be finished. Well, maybe we should be screwed, Robinson said. I'm not the one withholding evidence you are. I handed it all over to you and what you did with it is none of my damn business. What if they ask me about them? Do you expect me to lie? They don't know anything about any videotapes, Knight said. Seeing that Robinson was clearly uncomfortable with this confirmation of the cover-up of evidence, he continued. I'll say it again. If these videos come out, we're both going to be totally screwed. But what if there's something to this? Maybe that sick bastard really tried to do it. She wasn't in any of the videos, so we know that if she was there, it was only the first time. Maybe she confronted him and he didn't like it. Jesus, you've seen the crime scene photos. Someone almost blew her head off. You don't think Lyons is going to come at me with this tomorrow? Knight nodded. I know she'll come after you for it. But still, how do we know it wasn't Hubby? Notice he's not on the witness list. That's why he's sitting in the courtroom. He can't offer an alibi, so they didn't even bother to put him on the list. Yeah, Robinson said, but I don't think so. I also don't like Hubby being so close to Lyons. Knight's eyes narrowed. What do you mean? You can see her body language? Knight nodded. She has some kind of phobia about being touched. Yes, Robinson said. That's the first thing I noticed about her the morning after her arrest. But guess who she's not afraid to touch? Knight waited for an answer. That's right, Robinson continued. She doesn't wind up around her hubby. You think he's been doing it with her? Robinson shook his head. No. I looked it up. Looks like they were dating when she was in law school. Engaged and we're going to get married. What happened? She was abused. That's what happened. She went crazy and was never the same. After a few months, they got hooked up. A wave of anger swept across Knight's face. And this is the first time I'm hearing about this? What the hell is wrong with you? And what would you do about it? If you knew, what the hell difference would it make? It would be a pleasure, that's all. Well, Robinson said, at least now you know why she's fighting for Jennifer Bradford. She sympathizes with the victim. But there's no evidence that it really happened, Knight insisted. 
Robinson laughed. You know, before they can make that theory, it has to be proven that she destroyed him. And at the moment, there's damn little evidence that she was even in the damn house. They sat in Rebecca's office, sipping sodas while Rebecca listed the questions prepared for the next day. So how are you going to play? Rebecca looked up and saw that Ben was nervous. She smiled before answering. Well, she said, so far we're doing pretty well. Your little session with Deborah Broussard has more than paid off. How did you manage to get her to play along with you? Ben grinned. It wasn't hard. I just showed her some videotapes and she laid out the whole story. Just like she did in court. So you think she was telling the truth? I mean, did she lie to us or to the cops? Ben shrugged. Not a clue. But once she saw sweet Alain for who he really was, and I don't think she was too surprised, she just smirked and told me not to worry. She wouldn't be a problem. Said she was sick of playing the part of the grieving widow for poor daddy, and this would finally get rid of him. Whatever that means. Rebecca smiled. Well, she did a damn good job planting the seeds. And the rest of us. She leaned back in her chair and folded her hands behind her head. Well, let's just say we already have reasonable doubt that Jennifer was even there. And tomorrow? Tomorrow, my dear, we'll blow this case wide open, Jennifer assured him. Ben nibbled a fingernail. Are you sure we're doing it right this time? Jennifer nodded. Oh yeah, I think we got them all. After the fireworks display the day before, the courtroom was packed to capacity. Spectators squeezed into chairs, and about two dozen more lined the walls. So, detective, Rebecca began, you testified that you were first on the scene? That's correct. Before the plainclothes officers? Yes. I was only a few blocks away from the scene of the burglary case when the call came in. I left some officers there and headed straight there. I was there a few minutes after the call came in. And Mr. Broussard was lying face down on the floor in a pool of blood? Robinson nodded. Quite correct. Subsequently, you turned him over? Robinson hesitated, realizing where this was going. Yes. Did you notice anything unusual? Yes, Robinson said, trying to brush it off. There was a knife sticking out of his ribs and the front of his body was covered in blood. Rebecca smiled. Anything else out of the ordinary? Robinson sighed. He knew that further evasions would only hurt the state's case. Yes, he said. Mister. Robinson's pants were unbuttoned and his penis was exposed. Rebecca nodded thoughtfully, waiting for the growing murmurs in the courtroom to subside. And you heard the coroner's testimony that, in addition to the stab wound, Mr. Broussard had several other injuries, correct? Yes. And those injuries were a scratch on his neck and a scratch on his penis, correct? Yes. How many mistreatment cases have you handled during your tenure as an officer? Objection, Knight said. Goes beyond direct speech. Overruled, Judge Feldman said, without waiting for Rebecca's response. A couple hundred. And how many of those did the witness fight back? Fifty, maybe seventy-five, Robinson said. What kind of wounds did the assailants usually have in those cases where the victim struggled with the assailant? Robinson glanced at Knight, who only lowered his head. Scratch marks. Where are the scratch marks, detective? On the face, neck, chest, back, Robinson replied. Pretty much everywhere there was exposed skin. Rebecca turned her head and her eyes met Robinson's. And Mr. Broussard, when you found him, only had his face, neck, and penis exposed, right? Robinson, breaking the first rule of testimony, answer too much, mumbled his answer. What, detective? Ladies and gentlemen of the jury didn't hear your answer. I said, yes, those were the only exposed areas not covered by clothing, he said, looking back at her. And you heard Miss Broussard's testimony, correct? Yes, he said. You heard the part where he appears to have forced himself on the young woman? Yes. Did anything in the course of your investigation give you reason to believe that Mr. Broussard behaved in that manner? Robinson hesitated, turning to Knight again for advice. Knight merely stared back at him, saying nothing. Take your time, detective, Rebecca said. We all know this is a long investigation. He wrinkled at the contempt in her voice. Well, we've heard some rustlings, he finally offered. Rumors? That's it? Are you sure there wasn't something more, she asked? Evidence of a more definite kind? Robinson was sweating, afraid to answer and afraid of getting caught. Knight's face tensed, and he watched Rebecca's every move. What do you mean by definitive? asked Robinson. Detective, I think you know what I mean by the word final. She turned and walked over to the counselor's desk, reached into her briefcase and pulled out a stack of DVDs. Robinson saw Jennifer Bradford's body and face tense up at the sight of those discs, and her eyes widened. It was the first emotion, other than sadness, she had shown since they had begun jury selection. When Rebecca turned and held out the DVDs for all to see, 
Robinson was sure that his look of utter horror made Jennifer Bradford's apprehension look like giddy joy. Objection, Your Honor, Knight progressed, jumping up from his seat. Mr. Knight, said Judge Feldman, leaning forward and looking intently at the prosecutor. There are no questions or offers of proof. But there will be, Knight insisted, and I want it interrupted right now. Robinson sat silent, unable to move, watching Knight panic. Rebecca, on the other hand, only smiled as she continued to hold the DVDs aloft. The murmurings in the courtroom grew, and the bailiff's attempts to quiet them proved futile. Judge Feldman stood up. The court will recess, he said. Counselors, follow me. Feldman walked through the door to his chambers and was already seated when two attorneys entered. He smiled at them. So, Bob, care to tell me what made your briefs wince? Your Honor, Rebecca interrupted. I'm sorry, but I have to object. If we're going to discuss this, I really should ask that a court reporter be present. Feldman looked at her. She was calm as a cucumber and had obviously thought this through beforehand. He had to admit he liked her performance. For someone with no experience defending a murder case, she hadn't missed a step yet. What's more, she was making Bob Knight look like a complete fool. Good point, Miss Lyons, Feldman said. Jim, he turned to the bailiff standing outside the door, ask Francine to come back here for this little introduction. They waited for the court reporter, who appeared a few minutes later with his stenotype typewriter. For the record, Feldman began, we are in the courtroom for the People v. Bradford case. Both attorneys are present as well as myself. Turning to Knight, he said, When we stopped here, Mr. Knight, you objected to what looked like a stack of DVDs. Could you now explain the basis of your objection, however untimely it may seem at the moment? Knight picked up the words before he began. The evidence I fear is about to be presented is extremely prejudicial and will only inflame the jury. And what do you think that evidence is, Mr. Knight? Knight grimaced at this question, but nothing came off his lips. Feldman turned to Rebecca. Miss Lyons, he said, would you mind explaining what's going on here? She smiled broadly and folded her hands in her lap. Of course, Your Honor. You see, these are DVDs from Mr. Broussard's computer. They depict his various adventures in the three years before his death. Feldman leaned back in his chair and whistled softly. He glanced back and forth at Rebecca and Knight, and the look on Knight's face told him that he still hadn't gotten the full story. Does that make you uncomfortable, Mr. Knight? Knight shook his head. Feldman turned to Rebecca again. Okay, Miss Lyons, assuming everything you've said is true, what is the probative value of these videotapes? Well, Your Honor, she said, leaning forward and whispering conspiratorially, the vast majority of the videotapes clearly depict scenes that were coercive in nature. Feldman raised his eyebrows and looked at Knight. Knight, however, was still keeping a low profile. Do you disagree with the way Miss Lyons characterized those videotapes, Mr. Knight? No, Your Honor. Feldman nodded. Turning to Rebecca, he continued. Is there anything else, or are you going to make me pull everything out of you bit by bit? Before she could speak, Rebecca threw Knight a scornful glance. Just this, Your Honor, she said turning around to look at the judge with fire dancing in her eyes. Mr. Knight had those videotapes, but he never bothered to turn them over. From the way Knight's whole body tensed, Judge Feldman realized it was true. You're kidding, right, Bob? He said to Knight. You're prosecuting a slaying case where we know they're going to lump self-defense as an excuse, and you haven't bothered to turn over the videotapes that show the victim. I use that term with caution now. But none of them, none of them show the defendant, Your Honor, Knight pleaded. They're irrelevant because they don't show that she was the victim of any coercion. Lay off, Counselor, Feldman thundered. You know better than that. They're clearly relevant to the case at hand, and the defense had a constitutional right to get them. And you had a constitutional and ethical obligation to turn them over to her. But she already got them, Judge, Knight pleaded. There's no prejudice in her already having them, Feldman thought for a moment. So no harm, no foul. That's your answer? Knight nodded. Feldman turned to Rebecca. Miss Lyons, his reasoning is correct. If you already have them, what harm is there in that? The harm, Your Honor, is that he's hiding the most important piece of evidence in this case from us. And you don't know when we got it. If it was only yesterday, which, by the way, is the first time I've been able to look at all of these tapes in full, then how can I prepare a defense if they've taken care to hide all of the key evidence from my defense? Oh, no, Your Honor, we're clearly prejudiced. Feldman nodded. I can grant you a continuance, allow you to amend the witness list if you'd like. Then we can still proceed. And how do we know he's not withholding other evidence, Your Honor? Feldman turned to Knight. Bob, any more surprises for Miss Lyons? Knight hesitated. No. 
Feldman leaned across the table and stared at the prosecutor. This is your last chance to confess, he said. If I find one more piece of improperly withheld evidence, the case will be mishandled. Knight was silent for a moment. We're waiting, Feldman said. No, there's nothing else. Feldman stared at the prosecutor, realizing he was lying. Then he looked at Rebecca and saw the smile on her face. She knows he's lying too, and she's going to prove it. So, Detective, the last time we spoke, you were going to tell me if you had more definitive proof that Mr. Broussard had a history of coercing women. Would you care to share that with the jury? Robinson looked at Knight, who was staring straight ahead. There were videotapes on the victim's computer, Robinson said. They captured some, well, encounters that didn't seem to be entirely mutually agreeable. Rebecca threw him a sarcastic look. Do you really want me to start showing those videos? Or do you want to try and describe encounters that turned out to be less than mutually acceptable? Robinson blushed. Sounds like he extorted that from a lot of women. How many videotapes were there? A couple hundred. A murmur went up in the gallery, and Robinson heard the jury sigh from the courtroom. How many different women? Twenty-three. And how many of them depicted coerced relationships? Most. Rebecca looked at the jury, going from face to face as she spoke further. The majority? You want to try to determine a percentage? Robinson looked at the jury, all eyes fixed on him, waiting for an answer. He looked at Knight, who was staring straight ahead. Well, he certainly wasn't going to risk his career for this farce. He didn't want to press charges as it was, and now Knight was throwing him to the wolves. Robinson turned from Knight to Rebecca. I'll do better than just putting up a percentage. Of the 23 women, only three were consensual. With one of them, there was no consent initially, but by the third meeting it became apparent. And the others? Robinson turned to the jury. If I had those videotapes, and if Mr. Broussard were alive, I'd charge him with over 150 counts of aggravated mistreatment. Most of the jurors stared at him in shock, and pandemonium began to break out in the courtroom. Quiet! the bailiff shouted. Robinson saw that Judge Feldman was only shaking his head. The defendant, however, was still nervous. Curious, Robinson thought. She wasn't in any of the videotapes. Perhaps the night of the murder, if it could even be called that, had been her first encounter. And perhaps she was the first and only one who had not succumbed to Broussard's advances. As the courtroom fell silent again, Rebecca smiled at Robinson. Detective, she said, leaning back in the jury chair and resting her hands on the railing behind her. Have you interviewed any of these 23 women? Robinson nodded. All of them. Did they all have alibis for the evening of September 23rd? No. Did any of them, either the women or their spouses or anyone else close to them, own dark BMW 325S? Yes, Robinson said. There it was, the biggest chink in the armor. And he had no idea how she knew that. Judging by the smile on her face, however, it was obvious she knew everything. Did anyone with no alibi, or a weak alibi for that matter, own a dark BMW 325? Robinson looked at the defendant. Behind her, he watched Benjamin Bradford cross his arms and lean back in his chair. He knows the answer, Robinson realized. He's playing us, playing this game, and he always has. Robinson looked at Rebecca again. Of the two women who owned the dark BMW 325, neither had a solid alibi for the night of the murder. As the courtroom buzzed again, Robinson saw that most of the jurors were now openly smirking at him and Knight. We're screwed, he thought. Walking back to the lawyer's table, Rebecca stopped and stood still, waiting for the crowd to quiet down. Robinson watched as the courtroom fell dead silent and all eyes in the room fixed on the grim, tense lawyer. She turned slowly and looked directly at Judge Feldman, keeping her eyes on him as she asked her next question. Detective, she said in a loud and clear voice, you have been on the force for 21 years, correct? Yes, he agreed, hoping this wasn't going the way he thought it would. Still, he'd testified thousands of times, and when he heard it, he knew it was impeachment. And in that time, you've had extensive training in cataloging the process of your investigation, correct? Yes, Robinson muttered, seeing Knight lower his head to the lawyer's desk and rest his face in his hands. Glancing back at Rebecca, he noticed that she was still looking directly at Judge Feldman, and a smile began to curve her lips as her voice grew louder. And part of that process is preparing and filing police reports on every conversation you have during the investigation, correct? Robinson hesitated. They were dead on. Right? repeated Rebecca. Correct, he agreed. And you prepared police reports on every interview you had with each of these 23 women, correct? Robinson looked around. All eyes were on him, including the piercing stare of an obviously very angry Judge Feldman. Correct, 
Robinson said. Then can you explain why none of these police reports were turned over to the defense and were not listed in any of the documents provided to the defense? Robinson's answer was drowned out by a new murmur in the courtroom, and Robinson hung his head. Counselor, Judge Feldman barked. Cameras now. So what happened in chambers? Asked Ben, swinging his feet up on the coffee table and holding a wine glass in his hand. It'll be over first thing tomorrow. That's what happened, Rebecca replied. Feldman has lost his mind and is going to spend all evening researching and drafting a plea of nullity. He doesn't want to make a mistake and risk it coming back to bite him in the ass. He's going to make sure Knight gets destroyed over this. Ben laughed. Arrogant prick, he said. And rightly so. Rebecca smiled. Penny for your thoughts, Ben said, sipping his wine and looking at her curled up in the chair across from him. I'm still worried about how things will turn out tomorrow, she said. You know, after the trial is over. Will everything be as we plan? Won't there be another unexpected turn of events that we'll have to deal with? Ben smiled. Don't worry, he said. It's going to work out just fine. Now come over here and kiss me. She did, and each time they touched, it became easier and easier. Gone was the hesitation, the fear of contact. Though still tentative at first, she soon relaxed as their tongues explored each other's mouths and his hands gently touched her tense nipples. My God, she thought. It had been nine years since that awful night. What if she had been more patient the first time and not kicked him out? Would they have been able to stay together and have children of their own? Still, she had a second chance. They had a second chance. And she vowed not to screw it up this time. Jennifer stood watching the jurors enter the courtroom and take their seats in the jury box. Judge Feldman, she noticed, had a stern expression on his face and glanced at night several times. She knew it had to be okay, but Rebecca had kept it quiet. Rebecca had informed her yesterday before Jennifer was returned to the cell where she had been living for the past five and a half months. Jennifer spent the night in the cell praying, praying that the motion to vacate her sentence would be granted, that this long ordeal would finally be over, and most importantly, that she would once again be able to hug and cuddle her beautiful little girls that she hadn't seen all this time. She and Ben had agreed from the beginning that she didn't want the girls to see her in this condition and Ben had promised that he would tell them that she was out of town for a long time on business, but would be back soon. In the meantime, both Ben and Rebecca had shared pictures of the girls, but the pain in her heart only grew stronger each day. Ladies and gentlemen, Judge Feldman pronounced, quieting the murmurings in the courtroom. In light of yesterday's testimony, defense counsel has filed a motion to dismiss in chambers. The court has heard arguments from both the defense and the prosecution, both for and against defense counsel's motion. Before the court rules on this motion, it wishes to make the following findings. Feldman flipped through the papers lying before him, read one page, then began to speak, looking around the courtroom as the case progressed. First, the defense has given notice from the outset of this case of its intention to raise the affirmative defense of acquittal of the murder charge. That acquittal is based on self-defense in the assault. Second, Feldman continued, looking into his notes, under the due process clause of the Fifth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, the prosecution has a duty to timely turn over to the defense all evidence in the prosecution's possession that either is or could reasonably be construed as exculpatory of the defendant's guilt. Third, Feldman continued, his voice rising as he set his notes aside, the prosecution in this case intentionally and with flagrant disregard for the Constitution and the defendant's rights withheld key evidence from the defense. This intentionally withheld evidence included videotapes showing the victim's long history of possible mistreatment, as well as police reports of interviews with numerous other individuals who had motive and possible means to commit the crime charged. Worse, the prosecution deliberately employed a pattern of conduct designed to make the defense completely unaware of the existence of all of these individuals. Fourth, the court has grave doubts that any of the evidence presented so far, yes, the prosecution has not yet completed its case in chief, but I don't see it improving. That any of the evidence presented so far points solely to the defendant as the perpetrator of this crime. On the contrary, we now have at least two other possible suspects whose identities were not revealed to the defense until Detective Robinson testified at trial yesterday. In fact, and I want to make this clear, were it not for Detective Robinson's truthful testimony under not the best of circumstances, none of this would have ever come to light. For that, Detective Robinson is to be commended. Judge Feldman nodded to Detective Robinson, who sat next to Knight at the prosecution table. Jennifer then watched as Judge Feldman's gaze shifted to her. Without thinking about it, she felt her chest tighten and she held her breath. In all my years on the bench, he said, 
his gaze unwavering and his facial features softening. I have never witnessed such gross misconduct on the part of the prosecutor. Any evidence presented to show that the defendant was the perpetrator of Mr. Broussard's death, and it is quite uncertain whether she was in fact the perpetrator of that death, but any such evidence indicates that the defense she has put forward is valid. Feldman's face hardened as he turned to Knight. Given the level of prosecutorial misconduct and the serious damage to the defendant's rights since the trial began, the court has no choice but to grant defense counsel's motion for an adjournment. The courtroom erupted into cheers, but just as quickly fell silent when Judge Feldman slammed his palm on the bench. This motion is based on prosecutorial misconduct after the jury was sworn in, so the charges are dismissed with prejudice. This time, no amount of shouting from the bailiff could quiet the courtroom. Jennifer watched as Judge Feldman put his signature on the order form and handed it to the clerk before leaving the room. She turned and saw Knight slam his briefcase shut and run out of the courtroom, ignoring the questions that a dozen or more reporters shouted at him. What does that mean? Jennifer asked Rebecca, who leaned back in the chair next to her, rubbing her face as the strong energy visibly left her petite figure. That means you're free, Rebecca replied. It's over. Jennifer felt hot tears roll down her cheeks and the empty pit in her stomach fill with hope. She turned and looked at Ben, who smiled at her. She only smiled back, not believing her voice. Miss Bradford, the bailiff said, gently placing a hand on her shoulder. She turned and he continued, Would you come with me, please? We'll be right back for your things and get you out of here quickly, okay? She nodded, then turned to Ben again. We'll wait for you, he said. As Jennifer got up and followed the bailiff, she looked back at Ben, who was hugging Rebecca. Rebecca, she noticed, was hugging him back just as tightly. That's odd, Jennifer thought. He wasn't hugging me. Outside the courthouse, Detective Bradford waited for Benjamin Bradford to appear next to a crowd of reporters. When the door swung open, Ben led Rebecca to the microphones and stood aside while she answered all the questions. Can I talk to you for a minute? Robinson whispered in Ben's ear. Ben turned and smiled at him. Sure, Detective. They stealthily approached a deserted spot 50 feet from the house. You knew all along, didn't you? Robinson said without preamble. Ben's smile grew even wider. Knew what, Detective? The videotapes and the police reports. You've had them all along, haven't you? Ben only smiled back. You played a trick on us, Robinson insisted, trying to get an answer. You and she knew this was going to happen and played us. A cloud of anger flashed across Ben's face. Then the smile returned. Detective, he said. Assuming what you say is true, how could anyone have known that Knight would withhold all this evidence? That he would play into our hands? Robinson shook his head. But it didn't matter if you had all that evidence, did it? No, it only expedited your case and helped bring Knight down. In any case, even if it had all been obtained, you had us. Then why press charges at all, detective? The look of anger returned to Ben's face and his voice became hissy. You knew what a rotten bastard Broussard was and you made those charges anyway and did everything you could to convict her. As if the world was a worse place without that. This. This goddamn animal ruining all these lives. Oh yeah, who's the bad guy here, detective? Robinson answered nothing. Bradford was right. Assuming we had all this from day one, Bradford continued, and I'm not claiming that we did, but if we did, then yeah, we didn't really bother. But again, detective, Ben said, spitting out the last word with venom. The big question is why? Why did you make these accusations? You, of all people, knew what a monster Broussard was. Why did you put us through this? Robinson shook his head. I didn't, he finally said. I begged Knight to give it up, but he wouldn't agree. Said he needed this win, needed it to stay in office. That's bullshit, Ben said. You could have leaked all this to the press months ago. It would have gone away and you damn well know it. No. Instead, you just played along with this. This, uh... This damn far so you and Knight could pat yourselves on the back, win the election, and get promoted. Well, detective, I guess it didn't work out the way you planned, did it? And if you want to blame someone, start by looking in the damn mirror. Robinson didn't say anything to that. What could he say? He just watched as Ben rushed toward Rebecca, and then turned and walked back to the courthouse himself. Where are we going, honey? asked Jennifer, looking at Ben. We need to stop by Rebecca's, Jen, he said. He fell silent, his face turning into a mask and Jennifer felt uneasy. But I want to see my babies, she said. Ben, please, can't it wait? Ben shook his head. Ben, baby, what's wrong? He glared at her, and Jennifer felt a shiver run down her spine. Oh, God, she thought, this can't be happening. She bit her lip as the car pulled into the garage.
They rode the elevator in silence to the top floor, where they got out, and Jennifer followed Ben down the hall to the door. He pulled out a key and unlocked the door, inviting her in. Seeing him unlock the door to Rebecca's apartment, Jennifer felt as if someone had punched her in the stomach. Sit down, he said, pointing to the dining room table. She lowered herself into a chair and watched Ben. He was running wires to a laptop computer and an external hard drive. Then he started up the computer and clicked on a few folders. She couldn't see the screen, but she feared the worst. Seeing the videotapes in the courtroom had left her paralyzed with fear. But after listening to the testimony and making sure she wasn't in any of them, she decided she was free and clear. Now she wasn't sure it was over anymore. Here already? She heard and turned to see Rebecca walk through the door and throw her jacket on a chair. Just getting ready, Ben said. Rebecca smiled and clicked the latches of her briefcase. Then we'll need this, Rebecca said, pulling a thick manila envelope out of her briefcase and placing it on the table in front of Jennifer. What's going on here? asked Jennifer, looking at the two of them sitting at the table. Let me tell you a story, Ben began, typing a few keys on his laptop and clicking his mouse. Once upon a time there was a family and they were very happy. At least the husband thought so. They seemed to have everything. He had a good business that was just starting to grow, and she was rapidly climbing the career ladder, getting more and more promotions. The couple had two beautiful daughters, and everything was as good as it could be. Jennifer looked at Ben as he spoke and saw tears come to his eyes. One time at a party, he continued, your boss hired me to do a computer security audit. You looked so excited, so happy for both of us. And I was happy too. I wanted you to be proud of me, to see what I really do and how well I do it. So I put my best foot forward and was in your system in no time. Jennifer felt a tightness in her chest. He'd broken through. She'd tried to keep tabs on him, tried to figure out what stage he was at, but he'd never once given a sign. She'd underestimated him, she realized. She'd relied too much on Jeff Richards' empty assurances that everything was fine. Ben smiled through the tears that were now streaming down his cheeks. You've only made one mistake, Jennifer, and it was a very small one. She looked confused as he waited for her to guess. Your only mistake, Ben said when he saw she didn't answer, was at the party when you called Broussard a jerk. And just for the fun of it, I decided that he was the one I was going to break into the house through. See, it's people like that, arrogant know-it-alls that usually make the biggest mistakes. They think they're invincible and they don't bother to listen to everyone else about the little things. Little things like password protection and overall system security. And since you pointed that out to me right away, I unknowingly headed in the right direction to uncover the whole nefarious scheme. He placed the laptop in front of her, and she looked at the screen. First, there was this, he said, clicking the mouse and bringing up a series of emails on the screen. Emails between Broussard and Richards. Emails between the head of system security and the head of commercial paperwork that shouldn't be there. They probably didn't talk to each other five times a year, and suddenly we see them emailing two or three times a day. Ben clicked the mouse again and a particular email popped up on the screen. So here's what I've come to, he said. An email from Broussard to his own home computer. Ben clicked the mouse again. And it led me to this. Jennifer stared at the screen and watched Ben scroll down through thousands of deposits from Jensen National to a series of offshore accounts. And this, Ben said, clicking the mouse again. A folder appeared on the screen with information about each of the offshore accounts, including balances and passwords. So it was you, Jennifer whispered. Ben nodded. You didn't think I was that smart, did you? She didn't say anything back, amazed that he'd revealed the whole scheme so quickly. He was right. She had clearly underestimated her own husband. But she had no idea what he actually did or how he did it. Instead, she relied on Richards to thwart any attempted intrusion. The problem is, Ben continued, I knew there were three of you, but I could only identify Richards and Broussard. Frankly, I assumed the third would be Susan Flowers. The third was clearly a woman and just as clearly worked in the audit field. I remembered you saying that she and Broussard had something going on and I was sure it was her. Ben clicked the mouse and a list of folders appeared on the screen with the women's names with numbers. Then I came across this, he said. He clicked on a folder with the name Susan 9 and a video appeared on the screen. That confirmed my suspicions, Ben said, turning to the screen. There was Susan and Broussard. But there's no picture of me in here. Jennifer said as she looked through the list of videos. So what is it? Ben smiled. No, Jennifer, there's none of you here. He scrolled the screen with his mouse, running up and down through hundreds of video files. This is what the police have had from day one. Then you know I'm innocent, Jennifer pleaded. Please, Ben, I don't understand what's going on. 
Ben's sad expression disappeared, and she saw the pain and anger distort his features. Jennifer, he said in a hoarse voice, this is what the police had because I took them out. He clicked the mouse and six video files appeared on the screen. They were labeled Jennifer, one through five, and the last one was labeled Destruction. Jennifer flinched at the sight of the last one. Ben scrolled the arrow down to Jennifer's fifth and double-clicked. This is the video that changed my life, he said. She looked at the screen. There she was in front of Broussard, detailing a scheme to make millions, to seduce Jeff Richards so that her dreams of wealth would finally come true. You did it all for the money, didn't you? He asked. She nodded, looking at the screen. Whatever it took, all you wanted was money. To hell with me! To hell with our marriage! His voice cracked as she turned to him. To hell with our little girls, right? At those words, she sighed. No, Ben, I only did it because of them. So they'd never need anything. So they wouldn't go to school in secondhand clothes like I did, with cheap haircuts and not enough money for a prom dress. And they'd never have to worry about living in a trailer home. She felt tears streaming down her face. No, you're wrong, she said. They were the reason I did it. And every time I did something I didn't want to do, I thought of them and how they would never have to grow up the way I did. To be ashamed of themselves and their family. To be the object of everyone's jokes at dances, soccer games, classes, and more. Tears were streaming down Ben's face, and Jennifer looked at Rebecca. She thought Rebecca looked sympathetic, but she couldn't tell if it was to her or Ben. You've slept with others, haven't you? accused Ben. She nodded her head. That's how you got promoted so quickly, isn't it? It all started with Susan, Jennifer whispered. One day we were working late and she came back to the office after dinner. She had a little too much to drink and called me into her office. When I came in, she asked me to go over some numbers with her. I knew what she wanted. It was common knowledge in the office that she swung both ways. So you've become her plaything, Ben said, his voice becoming steady. Jennifer nodded. About two years ago, she saw the look of disgust reflected on Ben's face. But Ben, don't you realize I was promoted shortly after that? The youngest junior vice president in the division. Who else? Jennifer bit her lip. She introduced me to Alan, Jennifer said. Ben double-clicked on Jennifer 1, and a video appeared on the screen. He scrolled the video forward to the middle. So that explains it, doesn't it? said Ben. What can he do for you, Jennifer? She remained silent. You needed him to steal the money, didn't you? accused Ben. You knew all along where it would lead, and you needed someone with access to overseas transfers to do it, didn't you? She nodded, and he continued. And you knew you could frame Susan Flowers if it ever came to light, didn't you? She nodded again. So who else besides Susan Flowers and Alain Broussard? said Ben. Judging from your conversation in the first video, you probably had fun with Jeff Richards as well, didn't you? Jennifer bit her lip. He couldn't prove it, she thought. Their meetings were limited to Richards' office, car, or apartment. When she said nothing, Ben clicked the mouse again. This time, Jennifer recognized his home email account. My dear Jen, the email read, I'm so sorry about yesterday. You were right. I've never done this before, and I was too excited to go as slowly as you asked me to. I hope you're okay, and I hope it doesn't affect our relationship. JR, that was the night you said you hurt your tailbone, wasn't it? Ben snorted. When Jennifer didn't say anything back, Ben pressed her response to Richards. Dear Jeff, don't worry, honey. I look forward to practicing with you ad infinitum. Love, Jay. Have I ever meant anything to you, Jennifer? Asked Ben. She looked up at him, her tears already dry and a look of sadness frozen on her face. You've been my whole life, she whispered. Don't you see, I didn't mean that much to him. I want to be with you always and in everything. I only used him to get the money we needed. Ben shook his head. No, Jennifer, he muttered back. We didn't need the money. We had enough money. Christ, you drive a goddamn BMW and we could afford a full-time nanny. So no, we didn't need the money. You say you did it for the girls, Rebecca muttered, her voice soft. Jennifer turned around, surprised at being interrupted. But all this time you've been. With all those people, you weren't at home with your little girls. And all those nights you were out partying late, Ben said, picking up the thread of the conversation. I was home with the girls, playing with them, reading to them, feeding them and putting them to bed. Jennifer said nothing just looked back and forth between Ben and Rebecca. In response, Ben opened a manila envelope and pulled out a stack of papers. He placed them in front of Jennifer and put a pen next to them. Sign this, he said. Jennifer lowered her eyes. Decree of dissolution of marriage, the top document read. She flipped through the stack. An agreement to settle the marriage. Agreement on grounds. Appearance and waiver of notice. 
Petition for dissolution of marriage. Is that what you want, Ben? You want to get rid of me so you two can get back together? She stared at them, but the faces of both were impassive and didn't give away their thoughts. You! She screamed at Rebecca. You're my damn lawyer! You can't do this. You'll see, Ben said. It'll be very fair. We'll sell the house and split everything 50-50. I'll keep my business in exchange for you keeping your 401, K, and retirement programs. We'll split the furniture and other bills. You'll keep your precious BMW. Jennifer glared at him. And the girls? They'll stay with me, Ben said. Then he leaned forward and his face went rigid. The contract says you get visitation rights, Jennifer. And reasonable visitation. She saw his eyes turn to ice and shuddered at the hatred in his voice. But you will never exercise that right, do you understand? Jennifer gasped. You can't... Oh, yes, I can, Ben said. None of us will ever see you again, especially the girls. Understand? With those words, Ben clicked the mouse twice one last time. She turned to the laptop, tears streaming down her face as the video began to play. She watched in horror as the girl with the knife stormed into Broussard's lair in a rage. Where's the money, you bloody bastard? She asked. You didn't think I'd let a murderer near my girls, did you? Said Ben. Face it, Jennifer, I hold all the cards. If you make a fuss, that video and your whole nefarious scheme will come to light. And you're going to jail for the rest of your miserable life. Jennifer felt herself go cold. They can't charge me again, she said. You heard the judge. The case is dismissed with prejudice. That means double jeopardy applies and they can't try me again. That's not quite right, Rebecca said. You're right. The state of Illinois can't charge you again with the murder of Alain Broussard. However, the federal government can still indict you. Jennifer's mouth fell open. That's right, Rebecca continued. Double jeopardy prevents you from being charged in the same court, in this case, Illinois State Court, for the same offense. However, you can still be tried for all federal offenses as long as the charges are filed in federal court. Jennifer was at a loss for words. This couldn't be true. Do you remember Rodney King? asked Rebecca. Jennifer nodded. Remember when all those cops were acquitted in a California court and the riots that followed? And remember how two years later most of those same cops were convicted and sent to prison on federal cases? Jennifer really didn't remember, but she had no doubt that Rebecca was telling the truth. You see, Rebecca said, you violated the RICO law. Since there were three of you, it was a conspiracy. And every time money was transferred from Jensen National Bank to your own accounts, it was fraud. All of those transfers constituted a pattern of criminal behavior. And that's exactly what the RICO action is against. And when you destroyed Broussard to get possession of the money, you committed murder in fulfillment of the criminal conspiracy. And guess what? Murder has no statute of limitations, Jennifer. Right, Ben said, and she turned to look at him. So don't think about doing anything else but disappearing forever. He leaned forward and looked at her intently. Copies of all of this, as well as the chronology of this whole sad affair, are in a very safe place. And if anything happens to me or Rebecca, and I mean anything, it will all go straight to the federal prosecutors. So you better pray that I live a very long and healthy life and that Rebecca does the same. Because if you try anything, or even if any of us fall victim to an innocent accident, they'll come after you. Do you understand? Jennifer was flabbergasted and she knew it. Sure, she could look it all up, but it was clear now that they had planned it all out from the beginning and had foreseen every eventuality. And then she was confused. Why buy it? Ben looked at her with contempt. You've destroyed a man, slept with half your co-workers, and you have to ask why? Jennifer shook her head. No, she said. Why didn't you just let it all come out in court? Why are you letting me go? Is it about the money? Are you taking the money? Well, we admit you surprised us with your reaction, took us by surprise, Rebecca said. We just thought all three of you would start running for cover, trying to figure out what was going on. But no, you had to go and kill him. We didn't expect that to happen. We really had to think fast. But we did think fast, Ben laughed. And it really is better than if we'd just let you guys hang out in the wind before turning you all in. Ben leaned forward and spoke with venom in his voice. First of all, we're not just going to let you go. Oh no, Rebecca cut in. You'll spend the rest of your life without your girls, never holding them in your arms, cuddling them, or tucking them in again. Instead, you'll spend the rest of your life looking over your shoulder, wondering if today is the day they'll put you in jail for the rest of your life. And secondly, Ben said, we're returning the money. Don't you see? You know I'd never keep the money. But if all this came out in court, old Jensen would never think we weren't in on it. Whatever I gave him, he'd always question it. Always think I knew what you were doing. 
But now we'll get it all back and blame it on Broussard. The court made him look like such a scoundrel, Rebecca said. No one will be left in any doubt that he was capable of such a thing. And I'll make it clear in my report how careless Richards behaved, Ben said. He'll lose his job and never get another. That should break him completely. If he loses his job and loses you, I doubt you'll go back to him. He'll quickly go bankrupt and be on the brink of ruin. And Susan Flowers will probably go under too since her accounting department hasn't noticed all this for months. And Ben will be a hero, Rebecca said, rubbing Ben's forearm and looking at him. I'm the brilliant lawyer who exposed a questionable prosecutor and freed an innocent woman. And Ben will be the hero who solved a $6 million robbery and recovered every penny of it. Exactly, Ben said, smiling at Rebecca. Jensen will hire me full-time, recommend me all over the world, and my business will explode. Hell, we'll be rich, won't we, honey? Rebecca nodded, leaned over, and kissed him on the lips. Think about it, Jennifer, Ben said. We'll have it all, love, wealth, and two beautiful little girls. Jennifer watched him raise his eyebrows at her. The look said it all. She would have nothing. Absolutely nothing. She watched a tear fall onto the papers in front of her as she reached for a pen to sign the dream that had once been her life. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. So subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.